Hello, everyone. Welcome back to what's now, what is it, the third meeting of this of this group formally and these evening meetings once a month. So we're continuing today with our sort of initial topic of like the advent of artificial or synthetic molecular machines. We've got two speakers today, so the meeting is a little shorter, about an hour. So we've got Professor James Tor from Rice University and uh, Nicholas Giuseppone from ISIS in Strasbourg. So the talk's about 20 minutes. Um, we'll have the chat open for questions. Um, considering how things went last time, I think now we'll have things. If you have any questions about anything related to the, the talks at all, please drop them in the chat. Um, as you may recall from some of the other sessions the group's had, we're very interested in thinking about how we can advance work in this community. So those questions may get prioritized, but any question of any type is, is completely valid. So please put them in there and then we can take it from there. So I'll take up no more time. Um, Alison, have we decided who's going first, actually? Is there an order? Um, I think if we go with the proposed order, it's James first. Uh, and unless someone else has a different um, preference, I would say that's a good way to go. Is that okay with the speakers? Yes, yes, I'm ready to go. Absolutely. Then, James, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, I'm glad to see here <clears throat> some of my co-workers uh, that have worked with me, Guillaume Vives, uh, uh, has was a postdoc in my group. And then of course, Leonard Grill and Grant Simpson uh, have done, have driven all of our nano cars for us. So, so good to have you here. I'm gonna talk about nanomachines in medicine and also mention Nanorobotics LLC. <clears throat> we had developed a number of these nano cars and showed that nano cars could could drive across surfaces. This STM work was done by Kevin Kelly and we could show, and that was the first nano collision ever recorded. <clears throat> and then we, we worked with Leonard Grill's group and Grant Simpson to, to build and then race these fast nano cars. And we won, we won the 2017 nano car race where Grant took that nano car and drove it around that pylon, around that pylon, and then through these two goalposts. That was 150 nanometers in 90 minutes. And the Swiss group came in second, came in five hours be behind us. So, so uh, uh, Leonard Grill's group uh, in, in Austria, Graz, uh, along with uh, Grant Simpson and Philip Petermeyer, uh, really did tremendous work in, in driving these across, across the finish line. <clears throat> then we We've built a series of, of nano cars and uh, uh, Leonard's group has, has shown some of these related structures moving on surfaces. And, <clears throat> and these, these are based of course on the Faringa motors, which this particular motor is not that fast, but other ones when you, when you close down this ring will spin at about 3 million rotations per second. <clears throat> so what we did is we showed that these could actually move in solution and we could track them uh, uh, using, using these floor fours and we could get, get uh, these became the fastest moving molecules ever recorded in solution where they went about 25%, 26% faster than the normal diffusion rate. So then the idea was to have these drill through lipid bilayers and kill. And I had worked with, tried to work with several groups to do this and nobody can pull it off. And then I met with with uh, um, Robert Powell when I was giving, giving a uh, one week lectureship at Durham University in the UK. And I tried to uh, uh, work with Professor Parker. He said, look, I've got, a, I've got a former postdoc who's a new lecturer here and he's the best experimentalist I've ever seen. So Robert and I talked for about 10 or 15 minutes. When I got back to Houston, I sent him the molecules and within two months he had this thing working. He just utterly amazing. The idea is to put these molecular machines on cell membranes and then turn on a light and have them drill through, see if they drill through and leave a hole in their wake. And these holes do not close up. Many people have studied this by popping holes in AF, with an AFM tip. And they don't close up rapidly. They take minutes to close. So we had done a number of experiments. Uh, this is just one of them that we did. We did patch clamp to show that when you put a, an electrode in a cell, you put another electrode outside and you're looking for current between the two electrodes. Uh, if you, only when you have the nanomachines that move fast 
and you apply a light, only when you turn on the light, and these are UVs excitable, that after about a minute and a half, you start seeing current, then the current really increases. So again, indication that these were opening up cells. And so what we did is we took these nanomachines, and if you just, sh this is when we were using a, a UV visible, UV light uh, activated nanomachines. If you put these in the presence of cells, just with a blank with no nanomachines, just the light will cause these cells to start dying at about 300 seconds. I'm sorry, start dying at about 300 seconds, uh, but then they, they are fully dead by about 600 seconds. But what we found is that uh, um, when we have the nanomachines in there, they, they would die by necrosis much faster. We could really get them to start dying nearly immediate, immediately and finish dying where the other ones would just be starting. And then when we add propidium iodide in there, and so we had a number of controls, slow moving motors, motors that didn't have any rotors. We had lots of controls, but uh, uh, let me get the laser pointer here. So when we put propidium iodide in there, this is propidium iodide. Propidium iodide only lights up when it intercalates with DNA and RNA. So you put that in a medium and you start drilling and it starts filling up in these cells. Uh, and so you can see that you've drilled these holes and propidium iodide has followed the motor in. And so then we, we put some of these motors with peptide addends. And so these would target specific cell surfaces. And we could show that we could target, for example, uh, uh, PC3 cells, uh, human prostate cancer cells. And you can see this blebbing that occurs. This blebbing occurs because you open up holes and these are dying by necrosis. It's not apoptosis. These all necrose and die very rapidly now. So we could target specific cell types. So we could also do this with two photon near IR. So, uh, uh, so we could use two photons at 710 and excite these, these nano, nano machines that are 360 nanometers. Two photon is inherently, inherently um, uh, confocal. So you could, you could shoot right over one cell and hit another cell and propidium iodide will, will just pour into that cell and the cell right next to it doesn't even get hurt at all. And then we showed that we could, we could target MCF7 cells, which are a, a uh, human cancer cell line, another prostate cancer cell line, another, uh, uh, th this is another uh, cell line here. Uh, uh, th this is a, a breast cancer cell line. We could use different addends, peptide addends. We could target one and not the other two. We could target the second and not the first and the third. We could target the third and not the first and the second. So we had great selectivity in vitro in a dish when you mixed all these different types together. <clears throat> then we switched to visible light activated motors to see if these would more easily translate. And we showed that uh, uh, these visible light activated motors would react, this was with, was with human pancreatic cancer cell line. They would fill the, the cell membrane and some would get into the cell because they had inherent fluorescence. We could see this and then over time they would work their way out. So they didn't kill the cells by themselves. But, but if you put them in with the cells and you turn on a light now, so you turn on the light that you could really start killing these things. So if you put them in with the cells and you wash them clean, you let them clear for 24 hours, they don't kill at all. So when they are there and they are cell surface associated, you could start killing rapidly. And this is the fluorescence of the propidium iodide getting in there. And here's the fast motor that, <clears throat> that we were using. And this is, uh, is, we're exciting now at 405, so we're now in the visible. <clears throat> Some people have said, oh, well, you're just killing by generating ROS, and that is certainly not the case now. We've shown that. Because what happens is you can use a photosensitizer and really induce ROS in a cell. And what you'll do is you'll, you'll see, you'll see a, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, kill there by the generation of ROS because we're using cell rocks. And so it's a green dye. It exhibits bright green fluorescence upon uh, oxidation by ROS. So you can generate a lot of ROS. If you then add an ROS inhibitor, NALC, this ROS inhibitor, it will drop it down. So it inhibits the ROS. If you use light alone, here's, here's the generation of ROS. But if you add the nanomachines there, <clears throat> the nanomachines actually greatly reduce the ROS. And that makes sense because these have a twisted double bond 
which are just begging to be hit by reactive oxygen species. So actually these are ROS inhibitors. <clears throat> they are killing by a mechanical action, not by a chemical action in, in inducing ROS. They're actually ROS inhibitors. And we started working at MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is the biggest cancer center in the world, just across the street from the university here, working with Jeff Meyer's lab on skin and oral cancers. Uh, he working as, as well with Robert Rangel's lab and then uh, Ashish Kamat's lab on bladder cancer. And then the person doing a lot of the work is Dr. Cicero Ayala, who was my former postdoc. And uh, now he's working with this company, Robotic, Nano Robotics LLC. And if you look at, at skin cancers, uh, there's the squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, then it goes to basal cell carcinoma, is, is go, goes uh, deeper. And then melanoma goes very deep, can start in, interacting with the lymph system. <clears throat> and that's when skin cancer turns into something that's, that's extremely dangerous. Uh, a lot of old people, particularly with lighter white skin, they have to have these scraped off. And it's quite painful because you have to they dig quite far down and they, 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 the dermatologist will peel this off. So could we treat these with these nanomachines by drilling into these? <clears throat> so this is <clears throat> the killing of melanoma and oral cancer cells in collaboration uh, with the folks at MD Anderson that I had mentioned. So this is using a murine melanoma. This is all in vitro. Uh, and then you can see that if you just use the molecular nanomachines, they're not doing anything. Just we use 0.1% DMSO in water, that does nothing. Use DMSO in light, does nothing. But the nanomachines plus light, boom, kills everything. Same with this ROC1, a uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma cell line, just 150 watt and milliwatts per square centimeter and boom, everything's dead. We can kill the ROC3. And, and then uh, if you use ROC1 at 300, uh, again, we're killing everything. So they're quite good. And this is looking at the short-term survival, uh, two hours after uh, uh, use. This is again in vitro. This is 16,000 cells per well or 1,600 cells per well. When you have the molecular nanomachines and light <clears throat> just really wipes these things out. Uh, so quite effective. Then we move, we're moving in vivo now. These are recent experiments moving in vivo. So you in, inject uh, uh, this, this, uh, th th this uh, um, tumor line on the flank of a mouse. And then what we do is we let this thing grow. And after seven days, we will inject the nanomachines right on into the tumor, several points around the tumor. And then we shine the light. <clears throat> you can see just the DMSO does nothing. DMSO, just the light can, can certainly uh, cause an effect in, in having these not grow, but the molecular nanomachines are just tearing these things up. This is the, the, the size of the tumor now after, after 16 days. So you can see the effect of uh, uh, the nanomachines with light. Why does the DMSO work what? alone? What is DMSO? Why does, no, DMSO? why does DMSO work alone in this case with light? rather with no oh, it's, it, that that's 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 the light effect and dmso well it, it's interesting that dmso with light is is more effective uh yeah it's dmso with light the light itself has an effect on these cells on this cell line it's not so much the dmso as it is the light the light itself uh now we've, we've gone into bladder cancer if you've known anyone with bladder cancer they have to go in for treatment over and over again uh, it's really archaic. They will inject the bladder with, uh, with these microorganisms, which go and they eat up the epithelial layer of the, the, the bladder. And in doing that, they'll dislodge this, this, these cancerous cells. But when those get past that epithelial layer and get into the bloodstream, there's severe, severe uh, um, uh, uh, toxicity to the patient. Uh, but that's the standard of treatment. So we're seeing if we can inject the nanomachines just through the urinary tract into the bladder. They already have, just like inserting a Foley, it goes right on in. They even have lights that are already pre-approved for going on in there. This is in vitro. We're able to kill a number of cell lines, some better than others with these nanomachines and light. And so you can see the big decl declination that occurs with light with the nanomachines. <clears throat> and you can see the I <clears throat> IC50 measurements that even at, at two micromolar, they can be quite effective in killing off these cell lines. So now we're just moving this now in vivo for the bladder cancer. <clears throat> Let's move on to uh, bacteria. Superbugs could kill 10 million people each year <clears throat> by the year 2050. So COVID is like a walk in the park. 
for for what's expected to happen with with uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, so I tell students, when you're my age, uh, uh, expect this to be happening. 10 million people a year dying. There's already, <clears throat> right now, there are nightmare bacteria that the last resort antibiotics do not treat. <clears throat> and so what happens is you, you, have, you have a resistant bacterium just because genetically it, is, it has something on it, either something on the surface of the cell or something on the, uh, on the interior that deals with the drug where it's not as easily killed. So you end up killing off everything else. <clears throat> and that one persister remains with a little bit of, of, of some of the other ones remaining. And then what happens is these start breeding, these start multiplying, and you get now the resistant bacteria multiply and become common. And eventually this is all that has evolved there is these, these resistant bacteria. <clears throat> and so that's how you get these drug resistant bacteria. Meanwhile, the discovery of novel antibiotics is not keeping pace with the emergence of new bugs. <clears throat> so this is the new classes of antibiotics that have come in, nothing. And one of the reasons is there's no money in this because <clears throat> after four or five years, you get these persister cells and you haven't made back your money, your 1.5 billion of bringing a new drug to market and in the, 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 uh, the drug has become ineffective before you've ever gotten your money back. Secondly, it's just hard because these things have become quite resistant. <clears throat> so if you look at, say, a gram-negative bacterium, it has a cell membrane like a eukaryotic cell, but it also has a peptidoglycan, which is a peptide with sugars <clears throat> that, becomes, that makes this into a cell wall, and then you have another lipid bilayer. Gram-positive, this would be on the outer side. But still, these are called a cell wall now, not even a cell membrane anymore. And so we worked with Jeff Cirillo initially, this was with our, our, our UV active nanomachines and we showed we could just tear into bacteria. And when we put nanomachines with outdated uh, uh, antibiotics, they killed everything. I mean, they've just killed an enormous rate. We could take outdated antibiotics, which were inhibited from getting through the cell membrane. We open up holes and they go and then they kill. But then, uh, Anna Santos has been in my lab for a little over a year now, about a year and a half, and she's done this now with bacteria with visible light nanomachines. So again, something that is more likely to get into the clinic. You look at killing these bacteria with standard antibiotics, very little kill. And now we have, this is five log reduction with different types of nanomachines that we've developed for this five log reduction. This is huge rates of kill. She's an expert in bacteria. She's come here and she said, I've never seen anything that can kill bacteria like this. And so you, you have this amazing effect. And then what she does is she generates the, 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 uh, the, the, the persister cells. And what bacteria do is they also build a biofilm around them to help to protect them. And so you multi she multiplies now the persister cells. And then you look at the persister cells and sure enough, we can drill right through those. These are five log reduction. The normal antibiotics don't touch these things and we're just drilling right into them. This is a mechanical action, drilling right into them. Here's the standard antibiotics that are doing nothing and these are doing these five log reductions. Uh, we've looked at uh, the disruption of biofilms. So we're also able to disrupt the biofilms. It depends which type of bacteria we're working with. Some work better than others. Some we can just wipe out their biofilms quite well. Uh, what, we, what she does is she helps the, the evolution along. She gets the persister cells, isolates those and helps them to come along to really generate the persister cells. And you see the standard antibiotics don't kill the persister cells. Our nanomachines are killing them all. Nanomachines killing them all. And the, these ones that are showing here, these are the typical, the, these are the typical uh, uh, antibiotics. Here, the nanomachines are just tearing into these. So we've investigated the mechanism. We know the mechanism of these and the action occurs both on the inner membrane and the outer membrane, it drills right through the peptidoglycan. Uh, and you can see the effects on these, of these molecular nanomachines on these structures 
again, it, they're drilling right through the cell wall and then they start disrupting the whole thing in the interior. You, in these experiments, we're not even using an antibiotic along with it, just looking at the nanomachines on how they can kill these. And you see the effects, this is E. coli. Some of the pictures she's taken, these, are, these lines are because the E. coli is dividing. This is what they should look like. This is what they look like after treatment with the nanomachines. They get all of these, these, these uh, 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 shriveling occurs. So the whole morphology of the E. coli changes when they've been exposed to the nanomachines. So the visible light activated nanosphines display broad spectrum antibiotic action. They both in gram positive and gram negative, it makes no difference to these nanomachines. They disrupt biofilms, they eradicate antibiotic tolerant persister cells. They reduce the minimum inhibitory concentration of antibiotics with different mechanism of action, potentiating antibiotic action. And the mechanism of action involves membrane permeabilization followed by leakage of the intracellular components and dissipation of membrane potentials resulting in cell death. And this is necrotic cell death. There's no time for apoptotic cell death. All right, so the take home message is this. This is a fourth modality for medical treatment. One way of, of treating medical disorders is surgery. You go in with a scalpel. Another is radiation, which generates reactive oxygen species. Another is chemotherapy which I'm including in that immunotherapy and genetic therapy because both of these are chemical based. Now, if you wanna call these different, fine. No argument from me, we can call these different. But these are modalities of therapy that are occurring. This is now a fourth modality. It's mechanical effects at the nanometer scale. Molecular nanomachines are like nanoscalpel. Uh, if, if, if a cell can stop a scalpel, they'd be able to stop this. If they can't stop a scalpel, it's hard to stop this because it's a, it's a molecular machine. It's a machine type action. Now it could be that they might develop some resistance to this going on the surface. So you just change the surface add ends. Lots of nanomachines are coming out now. So you can even change the structure of those. So the projections, potential applications achievable in the near term and challenges preventing them. So we already have, so we, what, we, what we need is we're gonna, in this one to five years, we will have clinical proof and translation is achievable in one to five years. Here's the challenges, hiring synthetic chemists. Since the COVID shutdown, I can't, I can't bring in uh, um, good synthetic postdocs because so many, so many places where we would normally get our postdocs are shut down. Fundraising for nanorobotics has been slowed because we just were gonna start fundraising in January of 2020. And then, then uh, uh, so we have some seed funding, but it's, it's slowed down a lot. Uh, suitable scale-up operations for synthesis and final selection of specific targeted molecular motors. Those are the challenges because we have so many of them at work. We're trying to find the, the best choice here. Potential applications in the medium term, five to 15 years. Uh, uh, in this time frame, we should have many of these molecular nanomachines approved for clinical use. Certainly in the middle of this, this time frame, we should have many of the, these approved, especially because we're dealing with cancers that, that uh, uh, you could go to last resort uh, use and get it, get it installed quickly. Potential applications achievable in the long term uh, and associated challenges. Well, I think this fourth modality of medical treatment should be a mainstay approach in the coming years. Okay, with that, I end and open it up for questions. Yeah, what's going on here? There we go. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. And there's plenty of questions that have, have come in as well. So now it's forced me to select them. So I'm quickly, quickly scanning through, but I suppose we can just do them in, in order. So Ayusman, you had, Okay, well, so, I don't know if so, want it's, to so it's, it says, do you need one nanomachine molecule per cell? We have no idea. I, I, we probably need a lot more than one. You know, these are so small. We don't know how many, but uh, uh, I, I'm, 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 sh I'm pretty sure it must be more than one because when you open up a hole, that's going to be about a nanometer diameter. You're going to have leakage of ions through that. Uh, but that, that will close in about a minute and a half. So my guess is you need more than one. Um, Let's see, what's the advantage of nano drills compared to targeted nano targeted targeted therapies to date are, are chemicals. This is a mechanical effect. So I think that you've seen by targeted therapies 
uh, uh, for example, with these bacteria, it's hard. So this is a fourth modality. What's the advantage of radiation over chemotherapy? It is another modality. So, so you, it gives you more weapons in, in, your, in, 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 your, in your box. How fast are the okay. models actually? But your nanodrills are not specific. How do you, you, you okay. just attach it to a membrane. You can no, 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 no. I showed you several examples where we attach a peptide and it targets to a specific cell type. So we can do it both ways. So people can do the same with the drugs that don't require UV radiation. Correct, correct. They can do the same with a drug and then the drug gets to the cell and the, drain does a, the drug does a chemical effect. You can do the same with a drug for the bacteria and it won't work because the drug doesn't work anymore. All right, so it has advantages in, in that sense. Uh, also, this gives you a trigger that where can you use light? You can use light all over the skin, oral, GI, GI from top to bottom. Uh, so you get all of colorectal, you got all of urinary tract. Uh, bladder. So there's many, ear, eye, so many places that you can use light and actually direct only at that place is it activated. Doesn't affect anything else. Only when you have the double activation goes to that site and you have the light. So it's, it's like a two trigger mechanism. Uh, drilling so implies that the action of the motor, let me, let me get to some of the other questions. Drilling implies that the action of the motor is leading to translational motion through the cell membrane. Do we have an understanding of how the action motor action leads to translational motion. Uh, we have some, we have some, we've talked about translational motion uh, in some of our former papers in solution. And there have been models on how that works where it clears things out in front of it and Brownian motion pushes up, up behind it. But how it's doing that in the lipid bilayer is, is, is another effect. I am sure some are going out the other way. You turn them on. If they're not cell associated, they never go through. You have to have a membrane associated before you turn them on. If you turn them on right away, they just bounce off the membrane. Um, uh, 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 do we still have more time for questions, Allison, or should I stop? I think we still have, uh, have okay. let, let's do maybe two more. You, you, you're in such a goal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I want to try to get to as many as I can. Um, uh, uh, what, what exactly happens to the cell membrane? Well, we've seen these cells, these membranes, we've, we've seen the blebbing that happens, the result of that occurring. Is it a mechanical force from the motor pushing into the cell like a drilling machine, or is it a chemical interaction with a continuous rotating motor? Well, we do know it's not ROS activation. It's not ROS activation. We can see these go right into the nucleus. So they're going through the nuclear membrane because because propidium iodide just fills the nucleus. So once they get into the cell, they're still going. Does the motor have to turn unidirectionally for this to work? Uh, it's much better unidirectionally. When we use a flapping motor, so it doesn't have that other methyl center to give you the diastereotopic transition states, then it's gonna flap in two directions and, and the efficiency goes way down. Uh, I would say it goes down by a factor of four or five if it's not unidirectionally rotating. What's the half-life of the motors in the biological system? I don't know what the half-life is. I mean, undoubtedly, we, we can, you, you shine these on, on uh, uh, single molecules on a surface, and if you can see a single molecule going for a minute or two, that's pretty good before they'll die out. So I don't know what the half-life is, but presumably a lot of them are dying out, but we have a lot of them in there. What are the pharmacokinetic properties of the nanomotors in vivo? So we have, and what percentage makes it to the tumor of tissue? Well, when we inject it at the tumor site, we know it's right there. So there's, there's you know, we've injected it where we can see it. Uh, if it's injected globally, then we'd have to study that. I presume these are gonna easily oxidize like many aromatics like this. And we don't have to worry about them intercalating into DNA in that they're much larger than just a planar system. They're orthogonally arranged but I presume they're just gonna get oxidized and go right out the kidneys since they're only about a nanometer in diameter. Even when you have the peptide add-in, they're still quite small to be able to get into that. Does the motor attack mammalian cells? Yeah, it attacks any cells, any cells. So if you put this on melanoma on the skin, you are losing, you're losing uh, uh, other cells as well. If you're not targeting, you're losing other cells as well. But when you go in with a scalpel and you cut that whole piece off, you're losing other cells as well. So, so uh, um, yeah, there's, there's going to be collateral damage if you don't target. Allison, I'll end there, okay? Fabulous. Thanks. So you just rocketed through them brilliantly. You didn't even need, need my assistance at all. So that's fantastic. So 
Thanks very much for that. That's uh, very good. So we'll move on to the next speaker now. If there are any more questions for Professor Tor, you can either drop them in the chat or you should come to our gather session afterwards where more questions can be asked in person. So we'll move to our second speaker, which is Nicholas Giuseppone from ISIS. So if you want to share your screen, please. That's fine. Excellent. Yep. Fabulous. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind invitation. And uh, I'd like to speak today about the possibility to integrate molecular machines in larger system, basically to connect them with one another in order to extract work at uh, a larger scale than the nanometer one. Uh, so for that, I, I'd like to start with a famous example coming from nature, which is the functioning uh, 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 of uh, muscles. And you can see that if you go down to the nanometer scale, you find in this sarcoma unit, uh, this kind of molecular machine, which is a, a protein, a myosin head, which is able to uh, continuously uh, cycle a motion to attach a myosin filament to pull on it. And when all these machines are uh, progressing together, then because of the precise ordering of the uh, myosin filaments together with the actin filaments, they are able to uh, pull collectively on the sarcomer unit and to contract it uh, by a distance of about one micrometer from uh, a cyclic motion of only a repetitive cyclic motion of only one nanometer. And what you can see from there is that by connecting molecular machines together with polymers and together with, let's say, uh, organization, orientation, then you can reach what I will call here hierarchical mechanics, which can allow you to cross length scales from the micrometer to the 50 of micrometer in the uh, myo phase size, let's say, to the centimeter scales in the myofibrils and finally uh, muscular fibers. And this was very interesting for us when we entered this field to uh, explore the possibility to connect artificial molecular machines within polymer uh, structures, polymer chains, polymer networks, and to uh, study the possibility of amplifying their motions. So we started with this kind of uh, C2 daisy chain rotaxans, which were first uh, developed by Sauvage in 2000. And uh, we also made use of the chemistry of uh, Professor Stoddart in order to design this, what will become a monomer uh, unit uh, based on this uh, uh, inter-threaded, let's say double-threaded uh, crone uh, eaters, which can be either located on this uh, ammonium site when it is protonated, but which can then uh, slide toward this methyl triazolum site when uh, the amine is deprotonated. And this net motion is of about 1.2 nanometer. You notice also that at each extremities, we have attached here terpiridine units, which will play the role of stoppers, and also which will play uh, the role of ligands. So we will make use here of metallo supramolecular or supramolecular or coordination polymer chemistry to obtain uh, coordination polymers and supramolecular polymers in particular by using iron to ions. And then we were curious to see if we can detect uh, by looking at the polymer chain an integration of the uh, contraction motion and extension motion of each individual molecular machine. So this is what we proved is this kind of and neutron scattering and light scattering investigations, we can extract from this uh, data all the information about uh, the single chains of the polymer in the dilute regime. In particular, we can see a cross section, we can see a contour length, a total length of the polymer chain. And uh, what we can clearly see here between the contracted form in red and the extended form of this polymer is the uh, a change in the intensity of the scattered uh, uh, light, uh, which corresponds to a change in the linear mass density of the polymer chain. And we can really uh, extract because of the sliding motion and this sort of telescopic motion within a single chain polymer, 
This uh, change, which also corresponds to a change uh, in the micrometer lens scale of the full contour lens of each polymer chain. Uh, we can go a little bit further. We can aggregate these chains together by making use of further supramolecular polymers involving age bonds here. You can see that you can uh, uh, find by AFM structures that are similar to the association of uh, fibrils in muscles, let's say. But this is not of a long range orientation, just on domains. And there's still a lot of work to do on that. At, uh, you can, however, observe at mesoscale changes in the morphologies by contracting and extending the rotaxans again. And further, you can cross-link this rotaxan in uh, chemical gels of polymer and access now uh, macroscopic motions, macroscopic contraction, extensions of pieces of gel at the centimeter, uh, centimeter scale. So you can do this integration with various types of uh, supramolecular bonds. Uh, you can also use covalent bonds. You can probably also use different kinds of uh, molecular machines. We have worked mainly with the one that I've shown you presently, but obviously you have also limitation. Uh, you have a real uh, fully reversible back and forth motion of this type of switches, which work by changing the thermodynamic uh, minimum of the, uh, the, the medium, let's say, of the system. Uh, and uh, the second thing that we can uh, still uh, improve is this uh, organization in highly oriented fibrillar systems. And this is the object as we asked me to present some perspectives. There is a project, a European project, which is funded at the moment, a cooperative project, which has the objective to really organize these kind of C2 daisy chain uh, myofibrils, uh, rotaxans into myofibrils, fibers, and artificial muscles, and to control them with a, a robotic uh, approach in particular. We work in collaboration with roboticists here. And I think this is one of the main objectives now with these machines to uh, go further and to uh, gain in uh, efficiency, directionality, work out of these systems. But we were also interested to develop systems involving real molecular motors, let's say Brownian uh, ratchets, and for that, uh, we chose uh, to integrate, possibly integrate the rotary or the unidirectional rotary motion of fairing gas motors. And this is not uh, an obvious uh, question, but finally, we thought that it would be possible, again, to link such kind of uh, motors with polymer chains in a way that, uh, for instance, in a simple system, two motors would be associated to two polymer chains. And by turning these motors, if they are fixed to any element here, then uh, the, the rotation of the two motors should lead to uh, a twisting of these two polymer chain. And this twisting should lead also to a decrease of the distance between the two motors. So the idea was to transform a rotation event into a, a linear contraction uh, event. And for that, we first develop uh, the simple possible uh, entanglement that you can have with a motor and two polymer chain, which is a figure of eight uh, polymer entanglement, which is obtained here from the derivation of a fairing gas motor with two long polymer chains, which are clicked here in this figure of eight in a pseudo diluted condition. You can image this kind of figure of eight by uh, IFM, and when you light it, what you should observe is the twisting of this polymer chain and a sort of a collapse of the polymer chain on themselves, which can be seen again by AFM, but more interestingly, again in the reciprocal space by SACS, where you can see that this uh, kind of bump, which is characteristic of the figure of eight, increases in intensity by lighting, uh, which means uh, increasing the, uh, the density of polymer chains, and also with the maximum of the bump indicating a decrease in the radius of duration of uh, this uh, motor polymer conjugate. So we were also interested to use this kind of simple systems to uh, uh, possibly uh, achieve mechanotransduction in living cells. And this is the work 
which has been done recently in collaboration with Ancha del Campo in Germany and uh, Andres Garcia at Georgia Tech. So you probably know uh, that uh, mechano transduction is a very important event in cells which can drive many cellular function, but which can also uh, be controlled uh, in a number of uh, pathogenesis. And uh, the idea was here very simple uh, and was to attach a motor by two arms or two legs, let's say, at the surface and with the two arms uh, bind uh, cellular receptors such as integrins in uh, fibroblasts, for instance, uh, through a RGD uh, ligand. So this is the design of the construct. You see here a molecular motor, which can be attached at the surface uh, and linked to these uh, uh, ligands and then incubated with cells and also a control experiment, which will involve here a molecular motor uh, where the rotation is uh, locked by the presence of this episulfide. So first we can see here that by having a different concentration of motor at the surface, we can change the number of fibroblasts that uh, bind to the, the surface. And then uh, by irradiating uh, zones, uh, of different zones of the surface with uh, UV light, you can measure uh, statistically that there is a clear effect of the elimination of the motor with an increase of uh, the adhesion of uh, these uh, fibroblasts uh, at uh, the, the surface which is attributed to the pooling of uh, the um, chains uh, provided by the rotation of the motor. You can see also here that the illumination itself is not responsible for this uh, change uh, of the cellular response as the control motor does not have any effect. And also if you inhibit the dynamics of the myosin filaments into the cells with this inhibitor, you also uh, um, uh, avoid the, the, the mecha mechanotransduction in the cell. So this was extended afterwards in T cells, uh, human cells with a different construct here to bind a different uh, ligand. And you can clearly see here that when the mechanotransduction effect takes place, you have a release of calcium and then this calcium can be imaged by a fluorescent uh, probe here, which uh, can be verified in the presence of the motor, but not in the presence of the locked motor. So this is an example of this transformation of the rotation into a linear motion at the molecular scale, but can we again cross land scales by designing uh, uh, chemical uh, gels and networks of uh, motorized units, which will play the role here of acting, active reticulating uh, nodes in these uh, gels. So just by clicking the same uh, derivatives here in a concentrated uh, system, we can then access uh, microscopic uh, gels that can uh, then under UV light, either contract or bend, as you see here, uh, depending on the, the device you you set up, and this uh, 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 contraction is uh, the uh, result of the rotation of each motors, which can break then pairs of polymer chains and lead to uh, contraction of the material with the expulsion of the uh, solvent. So this is a very original, let's say, process of uh, um, contraction uh, compared to other kinds of uh, actuation using uh, polymers. So uh, we were able also to uh, extract some uh, quantitative data from this uh, rotation. In particular, we determined that the energy which is stored in the gel in entanglements is uh, about equal to one kilojoule per mole uh, per uh, turn. Obviously the frequency of the motor uh, depends on the length of the polymer chains in the gel. We also determined that to have a maximum of efficiency in this kind of gel, which means the maximum uh, contraction of uh, the material, we have to cross link the gel at a particular uh, concentration, which is important for, for physicists, which is the uh, C star concentration, which is the overlap concentration 
of the polymer chain before uh, cross-linking. And we also evidence that the variation of volume is equal to the variation equal, is, uh, varies linearly with the variation of the uh, shear uh, modulus in this matter. And in particular, that the, the uh, free energy can be uh, uh, written as a function of the uh, elastic uh, energy per uh, chain here. Uh, times the uh, chain number density, which means the number of crosslinks that you create in the gel as you twist the polymer chains. How to make this reversible? Because obviously uh, the motor is unidirectional, so when you have contracted your gel, you cannot come back. And this was the purpose of another study, which consists now in uh, combining a rotary motor with another unit, which will be able to untwist the uh, braids, let's say, uh, created by uh, the motor, by uh, also turning, but at a wavelength which is orthogonal to the wavelength of the motor. And in particular, we uh, worked with diarily tin here, that you see that can be locked in this planar conjugated form by using UV, so it means that when the motor turns, this uh, planar system can sustain the twist made in the uh, polymer chains into the chemical network. But when you use white light, you can break this bond and uh, release here two uh, freely rotating sigma bonds that can untwist uh, the uh, rays that have been created by the motor and the UV light. So now in principle, you have a reversible system, but I'd like to insist that the reversibility uh, is not a real reversibility. It's a reset of the system, possibility to reset the system to this extended form. But the pathway uh, that you use to uh, wind the polymer chains is not the same that uh, the pathway that you use to, to unwind them. So you have a flow here of the, the different rotations uh, for the contraction and the extension of the system. In particular, it means that they can work at the same time. So here are some results for different quantities of modulator. Uh, so the, the process is still uh, very slow, but still it is uh, reversible. And what it is interesting is that then you can work with two wavelengths at the same time. You can use a constant UV radiation, for instance, to constantly actuate the rotation of the motor and the twisting of the polymer chain. And then at the same time, vary, for instance, the intensity of the visible light to open more or less the population of diarylitin in order to release more or less the twists that are created by the motor. So uh, if you look at the total system at the macroscopic level, you can reach a steady state here, for example, for a given contraction of the matter, yeah, which is the result of a ratio of frequency at which the motors are turning, let's say, clockwise, and which the modulator uh, are turning uh, anti-clockwise. So you maintain your system here fully out of thermodynamic uh, equilibrium. So what we have been interested in uh, for a couple of years now, for almost 10 years, uh, is, uh, as I shown you, uh, the possibility to uh, integrate either molecular switches into uh, macroscopic switches, uh, or also uh, molecular motors into either macroscopic switches when the, the system is not reversible. But, uh, also uh, macroscopic uh, motors when the systems can really fully uh, work out of thermodynamic equilibrium. So there is still a lot to do in this pathway, but I think at the moment it's quite original if we compare to the sum of work, because there are many, many works uh, that are uh, dedicated to the integration in particular of molecular switches into macroscopic motors, even not using molecular machines. Huh? And uh, there, there, a lot has been done uh, there in the past, but I think still a lot of new things have to be done by using molecular motors. And this brings me to the open questions, possible applications uh, that could be thought about during the uh, next five years in particular. 
So we know now uh, that hierarchical mechanics, as I defined it before, is possible by using artificial uh, nanomachine. But still, if we want to compete with other types of actuators, in particular also polymer-based uh, actuators, we really need now to control the orientation of the uh, actuation because this will help us to have higher workloads. And uh, for that, we, we, we really need to, to tune the anisotropy of the, the chains, the bundles, the networks, not only by chemical approaches in the bottom up approach, I would say, but also by using chemical engineering and top down approaches, also uh, physical. Uh, engineering. I'm thinking about many techniques now that can help us along this way. Uh, we also need to control the speed of actuation. At the moment, the, the systems are very slow, and this is not something easy to uh, solve. In particular, if you want to work in materials without uh, solvents, because we need some uh, mobility of the chains to actuate our systems. Uh, we need maybe at some point also to control the production of waste, either to work with stimulus that do not produce waste. It's, uh, obviously, for instance, the case of light, but there are also other kinds of machines that uh, requires other uh, kind of uh, activation. And in case we produce waste, we have to release them. And this is also, I think, a, a question when we want to investigate these uh, uh, objects into uh, useful materials. Obviously, the fatigue is a classical question for the design of uh, materials, as well as the cost of these materials. The chemistry that is developed here is extremely complex uh, and extremely expensive. <laughs> so it's not possible to go and uh, see uh, people from uh, an industrial company and say, look, I have this actuator. It's impossible to, to sell this on the market at the moment. So uh, these questions will come sooner or later. And then I think, uh, as in the last example I presented, uh, from a more fundamental point of view, the cooperativity between ratcheting at uh, nanoscale and other kind of ratchets are uh, macro scale, their combination, their possible cooperativity are interesting pathways to uh, investigate. Five to 15 years, uh, I think we'll have to answer the, the question if molecular motors when going to macro scale are useful. I'm not sure about the answer. Maybe we can do more things with simpler switching systems. Maybe LCST polymers are very efficient to do many things. So are motors really useful for that? And then comes again the, the classical uh, question with molecular machine. Can we do something with motors in materials that cannot be made with any other actuator? Uh, I think one possibility is also, and this would also answer the first question, is to integrate motors based on the consumption of chemical fuels, in particular ATP, and maybe to design from their interesting biomaterials. So the ratcheting mechanism may be different, but still there is no evident reason for me that we would not be able to integrate uh, motors that uh, use uh, ATP to produce uh, higher uh, land scale actuation. And then the question we saw in the previous talk that now motors can go even in vivo at the molecular scales. Will this biomaterial will go in vivo at one point, making use of ATP to do something as implants or whatever? Uh, can we make use of motor materials also for another uh, possible application, which consists in storing and releasing uh, energy? When I spoke about this twisting of polymers the actuation and the work produced by the motor is stored in elastic energy in the materials. How can we make use of this elastic energy? I think we can achieve spring effects, which are very interesting in that case, and which can be then released very fast. And, and, and then this would be very something, something very uh, interesting as well. Uh, can we integrate molecular machines in complex uh, systems? I'm speaking uh, networks, uh, subnetworks, compartmentalization, etc. Uh, and can we program them for sequential tasks? 30 years, uh, it's a bit far away from me, 
But I just thought about uh, when was awarded the Nobel Prize for Supermolecular Chemistry. It was 1987. We see only the applications. I think uh, I'm speaking about uh, industrial applications uh, nowadays. Uh, I don't think we would have uh, predicted at that time that these applications will go in materials such as self-healing materials, re uh, recyclable materials, which are materials of high societal impact nowadays. So I hope that the future of material uh, molecular machines will have such a high societal impact in 2050. And uh, this kind of striking application, I don't know yet what it could be, but I know that, I know, I believe that uh, it will require multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, we have now as machinists, molecular machinists to approach other fields we saw examples with biologists before. Uh, we have examples here with people working uh, in material science. Uh, and uh, multidisciplinary approaches will be important. Interactions with industry. It's not probably too early to discuss with, with people there because we have to know about their requirements. And uh, we have to discuss with them because I'm sure we can get uh, interesting ideas from their, their side. And finally, we also need a specific training for the next generation of students. I think in our teachings, uh, the, the domain of molecular machines have to be taken as a whole domain, uh, specialization maybe. And uh, I'd like for that to make a transition with another project that uh, we are dealing with at the moment, which is this uh, ArtMoma project, which started a few months ago and which involves, you may uh, recognize some uh, great people in the field of molecular machines here, and which involves as well 15 young uh, talented PhD students with the goal to study uh, different domains in interaction partially with uh, industry and partner. You see that Solvay is involved. Uh, we have uh, also Danone, uh, companies that are not used and that were not uh, used. This is the first time for them to be involved with people working on molecular machines. But I think this will stimulate a very interesting uh, discussion. And it is the promise for new uh, interesting investigations in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank the, the people of my uh, group here in red who have participated in the work I've presented today. External collaborations, as I mentioned, which are very important uh, to give an interdisciplinary character to this research and financial support. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. That was a fantastic talk, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to address the comments in, in the chat yourself, like, like James did, or do you, do you want me to read them out for you, whichever is easiest for you? I to, when, when does it start? Uh, uh, 6.49, 6.46pm. Six I don't have the time, 6.49. So you've got the, is, is the Meccano oh, transduction? 7.46. Okay. Oh, yeah. Is the mechanotransition mechanism output considered a walk? Uh, no, no, not at all. I don't consider it a walk. The two uh, ligands are still attached to the, the ligand. So maybe this question is interesting in the way that obviously you have a K of K of K on K off of the ligand, which binds to the cell receptor. And you can have somehow detachment at some point, but if the frequency of the motor, let's say roughly is higher than the detachment uh, time scale of the um, uh, ligand, then you have a, a pulling effect which can be maintained. So th there is an, no uh, work in the sense of uh, kinesin or whatever. Uh, what would you need to make a full artificial muscle out of this motor system? How strong uh, would expect you, would you expect it to be? But for the the, the, the switches, uh, I've presented the approach of having uh, myofibril structuration. So 
uh, this uh, orientation first is a requirement and then the budling is a, another requirement to gain stiffness and to increase the workload that you can extract from uh, such fibrils. Then what you need is a control. Uh, and uh, this comes the question, if you can work there on wet materials, in solution you cannot, but can you still have uh, some uh, solvent to uh, keep some dynamics of the polymersion? Can we really dry on wet materials and how this control should take place? This is also dependent of the presence of the solvent or not. If you want an, a species that diffuses, to uh, actuate the machine, you need a solvent. If not, you need, for instance, electrons. So at the moment, we are trying to do that by uh, electrochemistry in the uh, neat uh, material without uh, solvent. Uh, then the, the force is high. The force is, is really high. I don't have values uh, in my mind because I'm not used to work at the macroscopic scale, but this was evaluated by um, roboticists and people like that. And there is no reason that you can extract a, a really high force if you sum enough machines, obviously. And do you have estimate uh, efficiency of the motion at micron or larger scales? Uh, work out. Uh, yes, one motor. Uh, so there is different uh, values that you can give. Uh, it's about uh, 12 kT. A motor itself. So this is related to the difference of energy between the unstable uh, helix and the stable helix. This is more or less the torque of the system. And uh, this is, corresponds to about uh, 10 piconewton per nanometer, I believe. Does the volume chain keep its uh, compressed shape after UV light? Uh, they switched off. Or does it uh, So it keeps uh, it keeps the it keeps the shape. It keeps the shape. Uh, we have now systems that, if we pull on them, uh, which relaxes to to some extent. But uh, but it keeps the shape. Here again, the directionality is given by the difference of energy between the unstable helix and the stable helix. What you do when you a twist the polymer chain is that you equalize these two energies and then you stop, but there is no reason that you come back at that point uh, until you uh, disrupted this balance of uh, energy between the unstable and the uh, stable helix. So you really have to pull back on the system if you want to do that. Uh, does the, do, 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 what do you, but obviously when you have the modulator, then you release the, the system. Huh? And this modulator is here a rotating unit, but you can uh, obviously think about other ways to release uh, the, the twist. Huh? You can have binding, unbinding effects, etc. Uh, what is the molecular mechanism of unlocking the reversible system? So at one point you have a you 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 have a bond which is locked, which avoids the rotation of the the, the twist of the polymer chain and you, you, you transform this bond to a, a freely rotating sigma bond, and, and you, you are able by this rotation to untwist the system. I need to explain that better with a, a scheme, but I don't want to be too long. Uh, and then I have thank you. Uh, so I have nothing to answer, except to say thank you to you as well. If you have another. Question: I can take it obviously, but I see that I'm late already, so I don't want to, to take your gathering time. That's that's all right. I mean, we started about five minutes late after all the intro, so you basically, I think we're just we'll say we're just about on time and give ourselves a bit of generosity there. So, um, Alison, do you want me to quickly share the PowerPoint slides I've got for introducing the next couple of? Uh, think, uh, well, to do that? We still have two others before, so I think uh, maybe we'll, we'll we'll leave it at that. Yeah, um, sure. I can share in the chat um, two upcoming meetings uh, in this group that we have. One of the one is uh, the one that I mentioned already to you at the beginning of this meeting, um, which is an, an optional just for fun brains on the Saturday, which you should have gotten uh, a Google Calendar invitation for in your inbox, and in which I shared the Molecular Machines Bounty Brainstorm 
form four. That's the Saturday for those who are interested. And next Wednesday at 11 a.m. we have Lisa Fiedersdorf discussing the National Non-Technology Initiative. And I'm not sure if Lisa is still here, but if you are, then we're very excited for that. Um, and well, yeah, I think, thank you very, very, very much, uh, James and Nicholas for joining. Uh, this was fantastic. Thank you all for your really great questions uh, to the entire group. I see a lot of uh, clapping hands, either via reactions or via actually people clapping their hands. So um, thank you. And I think that for now, uh, it would be lovely if we wanted to meet for those of you who are interested uh, in it in our um, in our gather room. And so I will share the coordinates for that just here. This is again, definitely optional. I mean, the whole group is, uh, is optional, but this is gonna be a fun way for you uh, to socialize with each other, to meet each other, um, cut the Zoom. Once you click on the link that I just shared with you in the chat, uh, you should be, get ported into our molecular machines lounge. Many of you know that lounge already. Just sit at a table, uh, start talking to each other. And uh, this is from now on um, a space for you all to get to know each other. Um, and yeah, thank you very much from my angle. James, do you have anything to uh, add? No, I think today's talks were absolutely fantastic, giving us more to think about and more to discuss afterwards and gives the group a, a um, adding to the sort of well-rounded view of molecular machines that I think we were hoping to get out of this seminar series across the year. So yeah, yeah. even though I had yeah. nothing to add, I still have plenty to say apparently. Well, so yeah, I hope to see everyone gather. Perhaps a nice um, icebreaker for starting your conversations together is um, starting it with what you thought of the last few slides of the presenters, which is the more forward-looking um, speculation on what could happen in the next five to 30 years. So that way, maybe a cool way to kick off uh, your discussion. And with that, I'll see you on Gather. I'm um, leaving now. I'll be a little bit in the chat here in case people have trouble logging on together, but I just shared with you the information. So I'm hoping that I'll see you there in a second. Bye, everyone.